Welcome to this episode of Clinically Pressed. This episode we have Sean Gallagher of Gallagher Performance in Murraysville, Pennsylvania. Uh, if you know where we're based out of in La Crosse, Wisconsin, you kind of wonder how we might have gotten Sean on the show. Uh, it is a connection that Kyle had uh, through chiropractic school. Uh, Sean has done some really incredible things, both in his own pursuit of high-level athletics and hockey and so on and so forth, uh, but also just in his career as a clinician. And uh, we really agree with everything that he's talking about in this and everything that he applies on a daily basis from DNS stuff to really good sound training principles to also just looking at things a little bit differently uh, and everything that goes along with providing great uh, service and uh, performance to uh, his patients and his clients. Uh, before we get into the episode, remember we are partnered up with Paragon Fitness. We got a lot of stuff coming out with them. Um, if you catch this after or before we start releasing all those things, so be sure to stay tuned with that. Uh, if you want to check out Paragon Supplements, go to paragonfn.com. Use promo code CP15. That's CP15 for 15% off at checkout. Uh, they got some great stuff, and we couldn't recommend them any more than we already have. So with that. No further ado, enjoy the show. Welcome to our next episode of Clinically Pressed. We're here with Sean Gallagher, Dr. Sean Gallagher of Gallagher Performance. And uh, what, what city are you technically in? So I'm in a, a suburb that's east of the city of Pittsburgh, uh, okay. Murraysville. Okay. And we're about 15-ish miles east of the city. Nice. All right. And I met Dr. Gallagher at Palmer College of Chiropractic, and he was... Um, the the man down in the um, with sports rehab and sports injury department uh, down there with Dr. Pavlicek and Dr. Jaring and I learned a lot from him and uh, would also go down and just hang out and shoot the crap with him as well. So uh, those were good times. Being an outstanding clinician, just a great guy and uh, interesting past. So I want to just kind of pass the reins and let you kind of tell a little bit about your your background. background. Um, all right. So like uh, Kyle said, um, let's see, I, I enrolled in Palmer uh, chiropractic school there in 2006. And when I graduated in 2009, I applied for a uh, residency position there at the college in their rehab and sports injury department. Um, and what's kind of unique about Palmer um, for those that aren't overly familiar with chiropractic or the uh, education uh, side of chiropractic is Palmer is the only chiropractic school that has a separate, if you will, rehab and sports injury department. And if you go to most chiropractic schools, the a lot of the clinicians do that individually. Um, as far as some uh, students and clinicians I've gotten to know, if you go to like Parker in Texas or um, Logan in St. Louis, the clinician that you're assigned to as a student essentially will integrate in rehab during the care at Palmer where, you know, it's more of your traditional chiropractic. If the patient is deemed in need of some sort of rehab um, or exercise therapy or something along those lines, they will write a referral to the rehab department. And so you actually have clinicians there that their job is, simply rehab uh, across the board. And they do everything from post-surgical to, you know, the kind of the mundane stuff, like run of the mill, hey, I rolled my ankle, I sprained my thumb. You know, on campus there with the, the rugby team and some of the athletic teams, you know, we dealt with a host of stuff with concussion um, and so forth. So you get 
a pretty wide exposure to various things that some chiropractic students don't necessarily get exposure to. Um, and that's what appealed to me about the residency position is it just gave you uh, basically 40 hours a week of all you did was rehab. I mean, other than working with you students um, and workshopping some adjusting skills, I didn't do much adjusting in the department because patients would be adjusted elsewhere in the clinic and then come down to see us. Um, and so you mentioned Dr. Jaring and Dr. Pavlicek. Dr. Pavlicek is uh, an ATC, and that's what he was for years before he became a chiropractor. So he brought that knowledge and background to the table. And then Dr. Jaring, who was, a, I think, one of the hidden gem minds in, in chiropractic and rehab because of where he's at, um, he's not out there. I mean, the guys learned, I think from everybody. Um, and there's tons that, as you know, Kyle have learned from him. Um, so clinically speaking, he's my go-to. Um, and yeah, he was an athlete. He was division one thrower at Iowa state. Um, then he got into skeleton and bobsled was a three time Olympic bobsled coach. Um, with the 94, 98, and no two Olympic teams. Um, so when you talk sports stuff, um, when you talk rehab, and he's well-versed in pretty much all of it. So knowing that's potentially what I have exposure to for the better part of three and a half years, um, that's why I applied, and I was fortunate enough to get that. Um, and then, of course, part of it was the mentoring and the background uh, of education that I can get with, uh, working with students like yourself. Very cool. <clears throat> yeah. I, Dr. Jaring is just amazing mind. Like you said, it's, it's crazy to see him work and, uh, kind of see where his, his line of thinking goes. Yeah. 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 Cool. So what then after, that? after that, then I got into business for myself, you know, after I finished that residency in 2012, I moved back home the Pittsburgh area and wanted to set up a uh, business that essentially incorporated everything that I was trained from a standpoint within that residency, um, you know, integrating functional rehab and that model with chiropractic. Um, but also as a former athlete, I had a passion and a strong interest in being able to provide that service as well. So um, certified through the NASM with their PES, um, which Joel, I believe you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's familiar with the NASM, you know, kind of curriculum and what they go through. Uh, I do, I do have an exercise science background. That was my major in college. So, you know, could have done the NSCA route, but just opted not to. Um, and, then I'm also in business with my brother who does massage therapy. He's also our, uh, our head performance coach. Um, and he works with a wide range of people from general fitness, weight loss, physique, bodybuilding. Um, and then of course the, the high school and college athletes that we have. So the two of us put our heads together and here we are, uh, four years later, still going. And you just moved into a new facility and you just gave us a little mini tour. It looks amazing. Yeah, yeah, we moved in here uh, beginning of January, so we're, we've been open four years, and our first few years we were uh, in another facility, renting space, kind of getting a go of it, and uh, knew long term that it wouldn't be the right fit for us. Um, so you know, we just had to uh, plan accordingly and know that from a business standpoint that if we were going to reach our full potential, that. You, you got to find your own space. You got to be your own business. You got to have that frontage, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's been uh, nothing but positives for us in a, in a very fortunate way. And as yeah. you know, there's a ton of work that goes into it. You know, it's fun to see the, the, the fruits and the, you know, the process come along, but it is a grind and you got to love the grind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It makes it taste better at the end. Yeah, for sure. So, so you also athletically have a background as a pretty darn good hockey player and then competed uh, with strongman as well. Uh, you want to touch on those a little bit? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, hockey was a fun thing for me. Um, I've looked back on my playing days and I was 
I was pretty fortunate to experience what I did. I didn't necessarily make it as far as, as I'd hoped. You know, it's just, just kind of a testament to how many good players there are out there. Um, and, uh, you know, so I did play college at Ohio University, uh, which is an ACHA Division I school. Um, did win a national championship there, which is pretty cool. Um, I thought about pro after, but, you know, that would have been nothing special, you know. Um, I did have some attention when I was in high school. That was pretty cool. Um, you know, I had NHL scouts coming to a few of my junior games and letters and everything like that for um, the entry draft back in 2001. Um, but I uh, basically opted not to pursue that route. There were some things that, that happened in more so my personal life with – I have a twin brother that – who also was receiving the same attention, but uh, for some medical reasons and procedures and stuff, all he ended up losing the eye sight in his right eye, um, and that derailed his playing career to when he still played. But then that basically took away some uh, junior A options, and uh, you know when coaches find out about that stuff, uh, they look at you a little differently. So I decided to stick it out with my brother rather than pursuing. Um, it's probably my best option after high school is to go to the USHL. Um, but I decided not to. There was a team, I forget where it was. I think it was in maybe Sioux City, but they moved to Tulsa and became the Tulsa crew. And I was like, uh, <laughs> that was the strongest interest I had. I was like, I like, I don't think I want to move to Tulsa. And that was basically it, you know? Yeah. Uh, nice. yeah and, uh, and then after my playing days, I just fell in love with strength training. Um, and eventually found myself doing something that I watched on ESPN. <laughs> and here I am, I'm like pulling trucks and lifting rocks like um, I'd seen these guys do. And, you know, I was a mediocre strongman competitor when you look at it. But I had a blast when I was doing it. Um, we got to do a lot through the Midwest. Um, I probably did about 14 or 15 of those in total. It's been very sparse since I've left Davenport. I've done two uh, since 2012, just with the uh, business and everything like that. It's really hard to commit to that strength training, and sure. I'm a lot slimmer than I was when I was doing that. When I, as you remember, I got upwards of about 300, and I'm sitting about 225 now. So little, wow, a little bit different. Man. That's a big drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm kind of back to where I was when I was playing hockey, and it was better for my health. But in the long run, you know. You were, think, uh, you were, where were you at? You said 295? About 295, 300. You were, you were a fit 295, though. I mean. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, sure. I was. But yeah. uh, it's just a lot. It's hard on your body to carry around that much weight. And I think from a, you know, I heard a guy, um, his name's Derek Woodski. Um, he's from Canada. He's, he's a pretty accomplished athlete. But I love the saying because he's, you know, in the sports performance and training world. And, uh, he says, you know, your body is your business card, right? If you're in the fitness and health industry, he says, your body is your business card. He said, you know, most time somebody is looking for a service, they're going to sometimes right or wrong align themselves or go with the person that kind of looks the part. So if someone's looking to get ripped and jacked, and they walk into a gym or a fitness facility or something, and they see a jacked and ripped trainer, they're probably more inclined to talk to them rather than the individual who might have all the tools and the knowledge and the know-how, but looks like they can't, as he say, uh, I love that he said, he looks like they can't bench press out of a wet paper bag, <laughs> you know? So, he, you know, he was encouraging. He's kind of blunt, but he's also encouraging, you know, like, hey, for those of you that have, the theory and the knowledge, but look like you never touched the weight, you might want to change that. Or for those of you that look like, you know, a powerhouse, you know, it's like you get a lot of guys that were former athletes and they look like that, you know, that classic stereotypical, if you will, shot put and, you know, middle linebacker look, you know, could just a powerhouse, but doesn't necessarily have the look of fitness to the majority of Americans he'll say like, you know, you might want to push yourself more to the middle because most people that embark into health and wellness, fitness, like 
they're mostly after weight loss or being healthier where you kind of those fringe people that at least in the private sector that after strength and pure performance, you know, I mean, we're seasonal here, uh, summers, off season, stuff like that varies. And so our athletes come and go, but clients that work with us the most are after kind of general fitness wellness. Right. Sure. And so I, I took it upon myself to kind of push myself more towards the middle, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, you have the ability to, to handle people with, with strength and athletic gains, but also you want people to look at you like, oh, you might know a little bit about weight loss and general health and good nutrition and stuff like that too. So that's probably the biggest reason why I dropped the weight. Got it. So what are you doing for your training now? How, how has your training evolved throughout this whole process from, you know, hockey to yeah. strong man to now kind of where you're at? Well, training for me was always purely for sport, right? I, my first introduction to training, you know, basically in the early nineties was, uh, believe it or not, like reading books. Okay. And I hated reading. <laughs> um, probably the most impactful reading I made at a young age was Yarmer Yager's autobiography. <laughs> okay. Okay. And for most people that aren't even that big of a hockey fan, they've heard of Yarmer Yager at some point because the dude's been around forever. Right. And in, in Yager's autobiography, he talked about growing up in the Czech Republic. And if he was going to play hockey and if his dad was going to get him new equipment or get him skates, well, Yarmer had to work out. And so he would detail in there like how he had to do, as he called them, knee bends. But they're basically like a body weight squat. Okay. Um, like thousands of those a day. Or he was playing soccer or doing some sort of physical activity. And that's where he attributed a lot of his ability as in strength, you know, when he got upwards, you know, of, uh, climbing to the NHL and so on. So here I am, a freshman in high school reading that book, and I just started to do – I started in the hundreds and worked up to thousands of bodyweight squats a day. Wow. <laughs> okay? So I think the first time I did about 250, and I was crushed. <laughs> you know, the most I ever got up to in a day was about 2,500. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> But I would I would stick in my room. This is how I did it. Like eventually, I I stuck in my room and I had a clock, um, and I would go for a minute. And usually, I could bang out about fifty in a minute. And this would take me over an hour. And then I would just do push ups because then you know you heard about Herschel Walker and Herschel Walker right. did push ups, and I would do crunch. So this was my introduction to fitness and sports training. Right? No internet, nothing. I just read books. And then I remember reading some about Emmett Smith and that Emmett Smith, when he was young in high school and college, he would take hot baths to basically soothe his muscles and recover. So I'd take a hot bath, you know, um, I'd go for like a, an 11 mile bike ride. I had like a two, two, three mile running course I would do. Um, and that all helped. Um, and then I got into weight training probably when I was a sophomore or junior. And then finally a very structured weight program. Like my dad bought a weight set off a friend of his that we put in our basement. And we had that Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia Bodybuilding. Like that's what we did. Nice. I, didn't have, I didn't really have any structured weightlifting and sports, like if you will, training until going into my senior year of high school. And it made all the difference in the world. And it's one thing I wish I had early exposure to because – as you read and you learn, you know, you can have so much influence on muscle typing and skill development at such a young age. And I did because old school thought when it was come to hockey was like, do slow, steady state aerobic activity, like ride a bike, go jog. And that's not the nature of hockey at all. Like your your aerobic fitness is going to serve as a a foundation and as a base for basically everything you do. But I mean, there's a point of diminishing returns, right? You want to, you want a good aerobic base to fuel recovery within a workout and a practice and in between. But I was doing no short sprints, no acceleration work, no like agility or change of direction. Um, 
and that was a challenge for me as a big guy was first step quickness as some like the call it, you know, and getting to, once I got the top end speed, I was fine. But my biggest challenge was just the acceleration part, which I never had guidance on, you know, and I think that's what I really enjoyed, especially through college and after is actually when college, I mean, we got introduced to strength training, but me and my brothers, we would design our own training programs and we would read and put things together and problem solve, which was basically kind of what we do now is problem solving. And I enjoyed that. But I think that's why I wanted to get into what I do now um, is because I, I had to learn a lot on my own and look back and think, wow, like I didn't get a lot right, but I didn't have <laughs> I didn't have a, I didn't have any resources, you know, not like today. And sometimes you get envious about what kids have access yeah. to today. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 But that's, that's kind of what training wise, that's what sometimes I've come back to. Like I've never really been a big aesthetics guy or bodybuilding, but I love training for performance and feeling athletic and I love strength. So, you know, for the time I was solely focused on strength, you know, I was all in on it. But now you can see again, like with, an aerobic base how your strength base is so purposeful in a number of arenas you know strength seems to just transfer into so many other physical abilities and i never want to necessarily lose a ton of strength my my absolute or max strength isn't what it used to be but my relative strength in many ways is better than it's ever been um and that's important for you know being able to relate and understand that and communicate that to our athletes and how we're able to connect those dots. And uh, I think you're a better coach when you can relate to your athletes. So having been through the process, um, I think they, they get that, you know, they know that we've kind of had a track record and we're not just blowing smoke with what we're trying to sell them. Um, And so I think they're more inclined to listen Um, and having been able to basically go from, one realm of training back to the next and then feel like, Hey, I haven't lost too much. And uh, that's, I think that's invaluable in the sense that you kind of learn how to piece together a lot of different puzzles within a training program design, you know, and that's kind of more of that, if you will, West side or kind of conjugate style training or concurrent training is learning how to piece these different physical attributes in where you're not necessarily blocking out like, Oh, Hey, we're doing a solely a hypertrophy phase and then transfer to a strength and then transfer to a power. But there's elements of all that in the program design. Uh, and then as you, as you tease through it, you can see where you need to spend most of your time with an athlete, depending on your goal, your time of year and stuff. Hmm. So is a lot of what you're doing, uh, seeing patients and um, like working on these training programs and like the performance side of things or how do you kind of divvy your time or you said your brother's kind of the head performance coach, does he kind of handle a lot of that? Yeah. You know, Ryan takes on and tackles a lot of the the personal training um, and sports training. My, my week's almost kind of like a 50, 50, which I like um, where, you know, clinically, um, with patients, um, and you know, the rest of the week, um, ath- I mostly work with athletes. I don't have many just general fitness, you know, cause I kind of know my craft. I know my area of specialty. Um, and so someone's coming to me for weight loss or expressing that interest to us, you know, that's Ryan's going to tackle that. You know, I, I know what to kind of say, but that's another animal in and of itself. Um, that requires uh, uh, a knowledge and a know-how that I'll admit yeah, I'm not no expert at. So I want them to get better guidance elsewhere. Um, but then that and then um, during the summers, I also run strength and conditioning for a local high school hockey organization. So, you know, twice a week in the evenings, I go do that. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a nice split for sure. Yeah, I can see it. Tying those both in. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But the, what, uh, what is your involvement? I see you have like affiliations with a lot of different uh, schools and universities. What yeah. what's your involvement there? 
Um, well, we threw that up on the website. You know, the, the, the company that we use to help um, build our website and design that, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to feature is certain athletes, the students that we've had come work with us, um, what high schools we're pulling from from the area, and also what colleges are going on to. Um, so that's mostly what that feature is on our website. Um, some of them we've done um, presentations to some of the high schools, like different organizations, like with, you know we've had local lacrosse teams, baseball organizations, stuff like that, reach out to us, and we'll go in and talk about a topic that they're interested in. Um, so there's there's that element there, but you know we're not going in and, and doing anything specifically within the school as far as treatment or working with the athletes. Um, it's more so, uh, hey, this is who we've worked with. This is where our, uh, our athletes are going and different colleges, you know, and scholarships that you're seeing across the board. Nice. That's pretty yeah. cool. Though. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's more so for the kids because then they get to pump their own tires, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure they enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fun for them. You know, they, that's why we do the social media. Like I'm, I'm not a big social media guy. Kind of like you, I don't have a Facebook. Okay. You know, yeah, all, all, there all, are two of us out there. It keeps it interesting yeah. when he's trying to promote something. <laughs> right. Exactly. No, nowhere to be found. Uh, but you know, we have it for the business and we like it cause you know, it gives the kids a, a platform where somebody's showing off what they do, you know? Um, and it's, it's fun for them and it's fun for the clients, you know? So, I think we can, we'll keep it around. I, I know I've seen uh, several, and I I tend to enjoy them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you keep it real. Right, right. Try to, man. Back to your kind of resources thing when you said growing up, and your story is funny because I feel like I could act much on our own and mine personally. Uh, I didn't do that many air squats, but I did a lot of calf raises thinking it was going to help me jump higher. Uh, yeah. Finding all kinds of random things on, you know, I thought if you had bigger muscles, you're going to jump higher. Made sense, right? Uh, right? Didn't have Arnold Schwarzenegger's book, but definitely read a couple flex magazines in my time. But uh, even now, like, it can be information overload and resources. What have you found best to, like, guide people to, for lack of a better word, like, the better information? Because I know we run into it here with our undergraduates who are trying to, pick up things and, you know, looking at internet celebrities and different things like that. Like how have you found best to pass on the best information? Best information. Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. Um, cause you know, I, I try to spend, um, a good chunk of the week, whether I, I, you know, I get an hour in a day or, you know, it might look a little different day to day trying to read, or, you know, browsing through YouTube. And I just like to try to stay up, like, where are people going? You know, some people see, like, you just kind of shake your head. And then you have your sources. Like, what, one of my favorite sources is, is Buddy Morris. Um, one, of, one of the kids I graduated chiropractic school with um, was a strength and conditioning uh, assistant for Buddy Morris when Buddy was at University of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, and so... His name's Mike O'Donnell. Mike Mike's in Fort Wayne, Indiana, um, and he and his wife were powerlifters. And his wife, and both of them world class. His wife won uh, a silver medal. I think it was back in maybe 2009 at the World Games. Wow. Um, in in US uh, for US, and that's you know like the World Games, kind of like the step below the Olympics. So she has like this silver medal that's like a legit like Olympic medal. So it's pretty sweet. But they're both tremendous athletes and tremendously smart. And Mike, Mike introduced me to powerlifting when I was in school. Um, I, he got me into my first couple meets and kind of ignited that passion for strength. And so I've always used him as a resource. He's no nonsense. He's, you know, basically tell you the way it is, um, what works, what doesn't. He worked with Buddy. And so I, I went to Buddy and through Buddy, I found like not his resources, but there's a guy named uh, James Smith. And James Smith is probably, and to me, I, I think he's the best training mind I've ever come across. And he's got a really interesting background. I believe he was a SEAL. Um, and so he's a, extremely intelligent. Um, but he, 
he was on Elite FTS uh, kind of Q and A for a while under the the name the the Thinker, but he's since branched out and he has a website that's like it's called Athletes Consulting. Okay. Um, and usually, like any of his resources, at least like from sprinting, he's got a manual that's called Applied Sprint Training, which I think is fantastic. Um, he's pretty well versed in a lot of the Russian um, authors and training methodologies. And so he's he's been a go to for that. Um, and anything that James puts out there uh, in terms of his recommendations, I tend to go to. Um, you know, as far as like chiropractic and rehab, you know, Kyle, a lot of the guys that you've mentioned, you've interviewed, they don't actually put out a lot of stuff. You know, they don't really hear from them, which is kind of the frustrating thing is a lot of the really good ones you don't hear from. Like Clayton Skaggs has no social media, no blog, nothing. You know, Brett doesn't have much. Corey doesn't have much. Dave Jaring has nothing. Uh, you know, Craig Liebenson's everywhere. Um, and Craig's, which he's probably the best access, you know, to a lot of those schools of thought from Prague, um, implementing DNS and functional training in a clinical setting. So, you know, he's, he's definitely worth it. Um, but as far as a lot of other stuff goes, actually, one guy just kind of got introduced to um, from a, a patient of mine. And I may butcher his last name, but his name's Jerry Bra Brashim, something like that. Hmm. Brahim. But it's I think it's spelled like B-R-A-C-I-U-M. I might have that totally wrong. But I guess he the guy's got a PhD. I guess he's got a PhD and he's got a website with articles and a YouTube channel that and he just goes out there and totally debunks a lot of fitness nonsense health wellness and does it in a I, I guess it's kind of an entertaining but very informative way um you know so people like that i think are worth it you know and then of course you have the the youtubers that are just like they're just trying to push themselves and try to make as much money as possible getting followers and likes and all that and uh but that's where a lot of our young kids go you know they want to watch the bro science stuff and they want to watch stuff where, you know, guys got gigantic arms, but absolutely no relevance. So, <laughs> no function. yeah, right. It's just, it's tough like that because there's so much of it. And they'd so rather differentiate yourself like with that because I know you kind of what you preach and what you practice and how mm -hmm. do you set yourself apart or kind of get people to see the light that, you know, this, yeah. what you're doing is going to get them more results than, you know, some of this other, um, more highly touted things. Yeah. You know, it's tough. I, I think that's one of the most unique challenges about being in business is, you know, you, you can have a great message, Kyle, right? You can tell everybody what, like the best stuff when it comes to their fitness or their health or their athletic goals. But a lot of people might be more inclined to watch a YouTube video that has better production or aesthetically, the person looks more of the part, you know, the guy doesn't have a shirt on, he's pumping out 315 for reps. And if you are telling the same thing, and you might just be sitting in your room talking, right? A lot of those tend to not get as many views or people click and go and that sort of thing. Um, so having a, a message out there that's good, that's consistent, uh, is one thing, but actually, getting the followers and getting the attention and people actually acknowledging your message is a whole nother battle. Um, I, I, no. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't try to, I mean, it's probably something you guys are faced with, with your podcast. I mean, there's probably thousands of podcasts out there. Unfortunately. You guys have, yeah. You guys have excellent information, right? Awesome information. But there might be somebody that would rather go to another one that, you know, because, oh, this guy, you know, it's Rich Piana, you know, or it's so-and-so. And there's not as much substance there, but because they are who they are, they people are going to listen, you know, and that they're going to be more inclined to dismiss you guys despite the quality of the information you have and knowing that 
they're kind of dismissing guys with excellent backgrounds. They know what they're talking about. They're educated. They're certified. You know, they've done things athletically speaking too, you know, and it's, I think it's a game. Some people play on social media, you know, people talk about performance enhancing drugs in the <laughs> realm of sport, but talk about it on the side of social media. Right. And some of these guys that have come out and some of them aren't shy about it, but exactly what being on stop has done for them as a brand and as a business, you know, cause now all of a sudden if they're, and they're getting all kinds of followers and listeners and it's, a lot of it may have to do with what they're using rather than what they know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of a, that's kind of a sad and an inconvenient truth that the reality of social media and getting information out their faces, it just makes, it makes it more of an uphill battle for guys like you sometimes. Like even like I'll throw myself in the ring, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah, you, but I, uh, I, there's good stuff out there. It's just harder to find. Sure. You mentioned DNS. How do you kind of implement that into your treatments and your training programs? And I know you used it a lot at Palmer. Do you still yeah. uh, you yeah. use it frequently? Yeah. So um, I was intrigued by that question when you plugged that because um, I know how much you've highlighted it on the show. Um, the thing I like most about DNS is the frame of thinking it provides. Right. I'm not always doing like DNS with everybody from an exercise standpoint or from a clinical standpoint with my patients, but I'm always using it in terms of how I'm evaluating, how I'm thinking about, um, you know, where I want to go with uh, certain progressions. Um, and I, I think the most challenging thing is trying to um, trying to meet somebody where they're at, because sometimes Patients come in and you can get a real read on them and they may not be ready for an active model like wham, bam, functional right in your face because it's not anything that they're anticipating coming in your office for, right? Especially if it's chiropractic where they might more so be expecting more of the traditional, you know? And so I don't want to overwhelm them um, with a bunch of assessments and movement jargon and stuff like that because... It's happened before and I never hear from them again. You know, they may not be ready for that model. But I think it's it takes some time to bring people around, trying to help them understand where their pain is or where the problem is, isn't exactly always where they feel pain. You know, how different things may relate. Um, and, you know, it may be as simple as if you watch them get them out of a chair and if you see certain things like, knee valgus or this and that and you just apply those models of of centration and alignment and you say hey hold your knee this way when you get up and they get up like oh my knee didn't hurt <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think that then opens the door to more of a conversation from that like dns model i think once you they kind of see that and feel that then they're more likely to listen and buy in what yeah, you're doing because yeah. in a way they have to they have to buy into you and they have to buy into what you're trying to get them through right they're coming in there because they hurt but when you show them something like that and all of a sudden it makes a dramatic difference in how their body feels you have their attention right um i, I can't tell you how many people i've worked with that sometimes like with their pain in their shoulders right I work with a lot of lifters um, and if we show some things like, okay, lateral raises, right? Lateral raises kill me. And you watch them do lateral raises and their knees are completely locked out. They're already in anterior pel pelvic tilt and hyperextension through their spine, right? And they're, you see everything falling and they're falling into internal rotation. But if you just stack them, right? where they should be. You show them posturally where they should be, go from the feet on up and you line up and you say, now do it. All of a sudden they're like, A, it doesn't hurt, but B, all of a sudden it's harder for them. Because now they're actually having to use a pattern that their nervous system isn't as strong with or as familiar with. So now they're more humbled and those guys that were using 30s or something, they're using 15s and they're getting smoked. Right? <laughs> But their shoulders feel better. And so I think that's sometimes where our DNS model falls into. 
yeah. you know, is just trying to show somebody, maybe it's not a DNS, like a functional progression or developmental type exercise, but if you apply some of those concepts into a strength and conditioning program, or simply you're showing somebody how to get out of a chair better, or when they're getting their kid off the ground, or they're doing yard work or something like that, you can superimpose some of those things over their movement, over their posture, and then use it as a tool to help them be more aware. And when they're in pain, then they might think a little bit better about what they did and like, oh, you know what? I need to be better about my posture. I need to be better about this. Then it becomes a, a great tool for them. Yeah, it can be applied to anything. I, I like that. Yeah. I think it's, you know, you think about exercise. I think uh, some really good minds out there, the, the, their only limitation is sometimes creativity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what a, a guy I really like right now, his name's Dr. Joel Seedman, and he's okay. out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, his business is Advanced Human Performance, and he's got a PhD in exercise physiology. But he, he does some really interesting stuff with different exercise protocols, um, with eccentrics, isometrics, um, and different lunge variations. And he's big into like oscillatory type movements, um, different implements, whether like hanging band techniques with kettlebells or barbells or, you know, like I saw him post something the other day with a, it was a lunge, right? It was a lunge though, but you're using a foam roller under the rear foot so it'd be like a reverse lunge or sometimes he has clients squat um on a slide board hmm. you wow. know so where you're in these environments where he says he sees radical changes in cleaning up technique relatively quickly and it's interesting to watch because they almost have to fall into a correct pattern pretty quickly or else the movement's not happening at all sure um, sometimes stuff like that can have its value and have its place. Because I think, you know, clinically speaking, or when you're working with an athlete or client from a training perspective, you don't want to overload them with cueing and coaching, right? You don't want four brain dominance where they're slow and analytical here. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you want them to be hind brain dominant. You want them to be fast and reactive and you want things just to happen. But if they're slow and analytical because they're thinking about everything you're throwing at them, that's really challenging, but if you almost give them a movement that teaches them what to do and then they can learn and feel it, then it's super simple. For sure. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's, that's an art in itself. And I think I really like learning from people that, that do that, you know, um, and it's something I've learned the hard way through. Sometimes you throw too many cues at somebody and then their eyes are glazing over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's and and DNS, as you guys know, there's a ton of body awareness, right? You just set somebody up in a low oblique sit, and you're you're combing through every joint in the body. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to expect that patient to go home and replicate that, that's a tall task. Yeah. You know, because they'll come back to you and be like, "Am I setting this up right? Like, you know, I don't know where my shoulder needs to be and my hips and so on." But if you can find just those areas in the body where like if you say just lift here, do this, and it, everything kind of falls into place, then you know, you've shortened that list. And I think now they just they're they're more inclined to do the exercise, but then they're also gonna do it without overthinking. For sure. Yeah. yeah. They're not gonna do it if they don't if it's too complex. No, no, absolutely. You know, compliance is hard enough. Yeah. Right. And you almost as Dr. Jaron would say, he's like, and it, you don't want to say this to be derogatory, but you almost want an idiot proof exercise. Right. Yep. You know, like some of the stuff that we would do in the clinic with bands, you know, like there's the, uh, there's a, the three month uh, supine progression yep. where you can wrap the long band around the feet and the ankles and so on. Like, good luck. I mean, you <laughs> might have one out of 100 patients that may, it may click how to wrap that band. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's just step but, one. But most of them aren't going to get it, myself included. I remember my first DNS seminar, we did that. And I went at home that night and I had no clue how to wrap it. I was like, well, I think this is it. But, mm -hmm. you know, 
sometimes that takes things off the table right away. You know, and I think that's, again, that goes back to kind of meeting somebody where they're at um, and trying to provide them something that you know is going to be effective. You know, it's like that classic, like do, them doing something's better than doing nothing. Um, and it's just that understanding if they're doing something, it may not be perfect, but are we really after perfect? You could chase perfect for years. You know, like Jerry would always say, I'm not after perfect, I'm after better. Okay. Uh, you know, I don't know I, that's good if you get better, then isn't that the goal? But I, uh, Dr. Andrew Spina, you know, with his functional anatomy and seminars and, uh, um, you know, I still say, you know, the nervous system's easily tricked. Um, he's got a YouTube clip on it. He's like, it's easily tricked. You can do some real fancy stuff to trick the nervous system. Mm -hmm. You can get a lot of people that leave your office feeling better. Um, and it almost gives them a false prognosis. And even you as a clinician could get a false prognosis. Like, man, this person may be better in a couple visits. But what happens? They come back and maybe they're not as good as they were when they left and they're a little perplexed. But as he says, you know, substantial change in the body is never made with one input. Right? You don't get stronger from lifting weights once. You don't get better at math by doing it once you know like it takes repeated inputs over a period of time it's no different with exercise in the body if we're going to change function you know that's where that's where the home exercises come in um and so got to be able to get them to do those repeated inputs if we're going to make change like Corey touched on that in your podcast with him you know it's going to take weeks you know, like you used to be that guy and same, same with me, like you almost try to pride yourself on getting people better within a few visits mm -hmm. and that'd be like a calling card, like, Hey, you know, you want to be better in four, but that happens every once in a while. Like most people are going to need weeks and months of work. Now, whether they're following up with you periodically or they're pretty self-sustained and they're doing those exercises regularly, that's how they're going to make the change. Um, I like to say like, you know, sometimes I'll tell people like, making an impact on function or changing function is a daily task and it's either you're, you're making progress or you're going backwards. You're not really staying status quo. So it is a, it's a daily task and you have to commit to it. And, um, intrinsically there has to be something there within that person, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You guys, you guys know that, you know, as an athlete, you either have that hunger to get up and go do your work or you don't, you know, same thing in business, same thing in life. If it's not there, it's something that no one else is going to be able to provide you. Yeah. We tell, I know I tell my athletes this all the time. It's just think how many things you did repeatedly to get to where you are now, especially with right. the stuff. How do you imagine I'm going to change that in a week? <laughs> yeah. I will make it feel better and get you going again, but you just did that for thousands of repetitions. It's not going to change. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I know with you, when you guys talked to Brett, he talked about that 10,000 hour rule yeah. and how it's kind of been debunked. Um, another guy, a great mind, Dan Pfaff, who yep. was a fantastic, you know, sprint track and field coach. Um, Altus? I guess, Is that what he's out of? What's that? Was it Altus? Is that what he's out of? Or? Yeah, I know he's in Arizona. I don't know who he's with. I know he was at, yeah. I think it was like LSU. Yeah. Somewhere like that for a while, and then he left. I know he's out in Arizona now. Okay. Um, but when I've listened to some of his stuff, you know, he talked about that, where he talks about, you know, you know they talk about repetition, repetition for mastery, and if you're really going to change a skill or see an impact, he said, but – He's like, I've worked with athletes enough. I give them a new cue and it just somehow clicks and they're off and running with a new pattern or a new gait like that. You know, so it is, it is funny. Like, and I've seen it before too. Sometimes you say something to a kid or you do something and it just clicks. I mean, just this yeah. morning I had one of my hockey athletes in here and, um, you know, one of the things that we use, he just resumed stuff because he got out of high school, finished it. What we just resumed with was uh, some baseline power testing. And so we used the broad jump. 
okay, as a baseline power test. And his broad jump mechanics are pretty poor. Um, he, does, he wasn't hip hinging well. So used a, a band, right, put it around his waist, and I provide resistance back against him. So it forces him to kind of sit back in his hips and then jump through the band, if you will. And just doing that alone and clean up his mechanics, it added like three or four inches to his broad wow. jump, right? And then he was just off and running with a better, like every broad jump after that was perfect, right? So it's just funny how you can use a tool like that and it clicks with the, it just clicked for him. Like yeah, I was, just I was, I was cueing him on the hip hinge and he wasn't getting it. I used that external cueing yeah, and all of a sudden it. he made sense. You might like uh, Nick Winkleman. He used to be at Exos. Um, I think he's over working with like the Irish Rugby Federation, but he did uh, his PhD on internal versus external cues and how just it seems to be so much more beneficial to go external where they can actually, you know, picture what you're saying, you know, where you're talking about spreading the ground or giving them a physical cue and not just saying, push your hips yeah. back, hip in. Exactly. Yeah, it's just, you yeah. notice that it's so much more powerful um, going through that. Yeah, and I think that's kind of why I've learned, like, I, I like learning from somebody like um, Liebenson. Jaron was really good at that. And then even the guy I mentioned earlier, Joel Seedman. I mean, the way they use implements and resistance a lot of times is, is more so about that external cueing. Like one of the things that Joel talks about in some of his writing, because he does extensive writing, is with the, um, with the slide board squatting or lunging, you know, how you have to basically root your foot into the ground so you're not sliding. So it automatically teaches someone how to properly root their foot. And you take that, you take that away and now you stick them under load. Now, now they know what you're talking about. You know, now it clicks because now they have the feel. If they can't feel it, they'll never replicate it. For sure. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like, would I ever load somebody up with hundreds of pounds and put them on a slide board and have them squat? No. You Maybe. have a YouTube sensation. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. YouTube. Yeah, exactly. That's see, that's what we're doing wrong guys. Just like, yeah. the, just like the physio <laughs> yeah. ball. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, to that, to that point is, you know, if you give them some moderate resistance, you know, a, a, tw a 20, kilo kettlebell and they're holding it goblet squile style and then they do that and then they get under the bar and now they're more in tune with what they need to do um to help clean up some of their movement bam that's what you're doing um the other another guy i really like is his name's uh kale deets he's yeah. up at university of minnesota He's got some um, I know he's done he's done a number of podcasts. I'm sure he'd probably be willing to talk to you guys too. Yeah, um, I want to get into him at some point. We got to get a Twin Cities trip in. Yeah, yeah. But the guys like with his triphasic training and some of his, uh, I mean, you you can't necessarily call it peer reviewed research, but like he's in the lab. They're using sensors and monitors with their athletes, and then he's tracking. And he's got you know all kinds of data that he's plotted um one of the most interesting things i've seen from him was something he just did with he calls it neural perplexity training and uh he, he works a ton with um the the hockey teams there at uh the university but he had guys on a, a treadmill skating treadmill right and they had all kind of markers and so they were basically watching the fluidity of their stride, kind of length and all that stuff, stride height and so on. And then they had them stick handling. And then they had them stick handling and basically like someone would call out like a, a math question. So they had to think. And what got him going on this route was he's like, you know, when I watch hockey games, you know, I always saw this tendency when players get into tight areas, uh, they stop moving their feet. And coaches are always saying, move your feet, move your feet. But it's like they get in these tight areas where there's a lot going on. They're battling for pucks. They're trying to 
you know, read the play and understand where guys are at, where the soft area is at, where they can go, sometimes the feet stop moving, right? And so what they saw with this when he plotted it is what they were doing just free skating versus when they did um, stick handling, there was changes in the mechanics. And then the more complex it got, the more it affected their stride quality Interesting. and their power output. But he said the, the ones that scored the best is best, best athletes. Um, I think he said the five top ones went on to the NHL. And he would oh. just say the number like they, the five of them collectively, you know, their salaries were over like 130 million. So, we're talking about good. so he said, you know, better athletes handle those stimuli better without it affecting their physical performance. Hmm. Makes so, sense. So he, he tries to implement some of those things into the off season. He said, you know, in season athletes have enough of that with, with sport <laughs> practice and, and competition. But off season, he's like, you know, there might be some validity to it. Like in the past, you know, sometimes I've knocked speed training when it comes to the use of speed ladders, right? Because it's not true mm -hmm. speed training, but it can be a valuable tool for teaching athletes um, coordination, rhythm, relaxation, timing, which are all critically important to athleticism. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but he'll have them do ladder drills and they may do some juggling or do some work with a tennis ball and he may have them. You know, he may say, hey, I'm going to call it a number and you subtract two from it. So he'll say 11 and they might say nine, right? Seven, five, so on. And so he tries to train some of those elements because it is a, it, it's a trainable attribute. But um, it's, it's kind of cool when you can see those things in our setting and make a, make a little bit of a, you know, you're always learning and looking for things to, to – help give some of these kids a little bit of a better edge, if you will. Yeah. Plus they're getting better at math. Absolutely. Got to help you those know. college kids. They hate it. Yeah, that's right. You know, mom and dad will be happy. Yeah. There you go. Well, I know in the essence of time, you've got a patient uh, approaching here. So should we just, yeah. do you have any other questions? Otherwise jump into the, no, we can jump into the other ones. Here. We'll have to do yeah. a follow up on some more stuff at some point. Yeah. I have a feeling we could talk for a while. Yeah. I know. That's what Kyle said. Like, because we used to do this in the department. We would just sit and talk, and we get on random topics and just go. And uh, and that was fun because that's the thing I miss most about the residency is there's so many interns with so many unique backgrounds and insights. You know, you mentioned about the guy you guys had earlier was triathlete or ultra marathon, or like we had kids that did that stuff. We had kids from different, you know. Uh, division one, division three, you know, college backgrounds um, and to sit and learn and listen. And then even, you know, clinically, a lot of them do the same things, rehab, DNS, ART, Graston, you know, functional related seminars, but the way they interpret stuff or the way they apply it clinically, you can sit and talk. Um, it was really cool to be a part of that and learn. So uh, that's that's what reminded me about this a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, so, uh, what? Starting off, what is the most influential purchase that you have for hundred dollars or less? Hundred dollars is this a fitness related purchase? Like you doesn't said, it it doesn't it can be if you'd like it? it otherwise, it can be uh, anything. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna have a couple here. Okay. One because this. I, you made me really think on this one. <laughs> um, I would say uh, one, and this would be more for athlete, general athleticism, the jump rope. Oh, all right. I think it's That's like cool. a lost art. And I think jump rope is about as low grade or as introductory to a plyometric as you can get. Um, I played hockey with a kid whose brother ended up playing junior A out in, I think, Bozeman or somewhere in Montana. But he would do like – thousands of jump rope a day and his footwork was just impeccable and that i, I kind of with like i shared the story about yager and that i mean that's another thing i did as a young kid for footwork was jump rope um you know i, I think there's a tremendous conditioning element to it as well um so i i think and it's you can take it literally anywhere oh, with yeah. you um so i think jump rope uh, would, would be on the list um, for 
a few different reasons. Um, Mark Bell's hip circle. Um, Mark Bell, you know, he has a slingshot and how much you bench, but he came up with something called the hip circle, and I love it. You know, most people use those little perform better bands, um, but the hip circle dominates those every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Really? Um, we use I use the hip yeah. circle now. Um, they'll last forever. They're a ton more comfortable to use because if you're a guy using a, one of those little bands, it's going to rip your hairs like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> um, at the hip circle – it's so versatile. Um, honestly, it's a part of the staple of our dynamic warm-ups. I use it all the time. Um, in many ways, I feel like it's really helped me, athletically speaking, and my hips just feel awesome, you know, with regular use of it. Um, and that's 25 bucks, uh, And you get free shipping through him, too. Nice. So that's okay. kind of cool. There you go. Yeah, I love um Right. Yeah. So I would say, I would say that no, no, those two would be what I go to my, my go-tos. Check you know? out the hip circle. Yeah. Cause I know guys have said bands and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that's, I think my, my two. There you go. Cool. What's something that you believe that maybe others do not? What should I say? Aliens? Yeah. That's, it's been used. Uh, no, you know, that was, that was a, that was a tough one for me too. Um, but, uh, I, I think, you know, I guess this is kind of an, uh, and something I've done more so athletically speaking. And then you see it as, uh, you know, at academically, and it's been more of a, a frustration business wise, but, you know, I always knew if I, I would always write down goals. Okay. Like I remember typing out stuff and hanging in my room went for hockey. Like this is what I wanted to do. And I worked to get to where I was at, whether it was the exercises, I would shoot pucks in my driveway or in my garage. And my parents hated that because they had to replace their garages a number of times with four boys, you know, but I knew what I wanted and I had to work for it. And I would see the benefit because I saw myself, making the teams that I wanted to getting better. And, you know, with academics, I always saw, um, you know, you put more time in, you got a better grade, you got a better mark business. And that's not always added up that way. It's not that one plus one equals two, you know, you can put a ton of time in and be super motivated, but it doesn't necessarily mean more people are coming in the door. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and so I think it's more so, I believe that the energy that you put in, the effort that you put in is ultimately going to be fruitful. And it may, I think just, I think Corey said it, I believe he said, I think too, too many people give up too quickly. And I think that's kind of where I'm, I'm at with it is, um, I mean, it's, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but I think ultimately you will see it, you know, if you give the energy, you give the quality of care, you care for people and you, you know, you're given a plus effort day in, day out, which is a grind in itself. Um, that, you know, I fully believe that there's going to be success, mm -hmm. you know, we're not maybe talking about Insta famous success and we're getting millions of dollars for making a couple posts, but you know, it's going to be there. So I would, I would say that I think that that perseverance and that resiliency isn't necessarily there with everybody. And that to have that belief that ultimately what you're doing is going to pay off, you know, like Ray, Ray Bork didn't win a cup until what he'd been in the league, like 20 years. One of the greatest players of all time didn't actually get to enjoy something that fruitful and successful until the end of his career. So some of, some of us comes rather immediate and some of us are going to work 15, 20 years. And I'm okay with that because I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. You love what you do. It's good. Yeah. Got a question? Book recommendations? Book recommendations. Um, I guess kind of on what topic. Um, I mean, I love uh, Pavel's book, The Clinical Rehabilitation. Um, mm -hmm. That's an invaluable resource. 
Uh, Warren Hammer's book, I think it's um, something about manual methods for soft tissue rehabilitation, stuff like that. And then I just bought, uh, uh, let me grab it here, um, this functional neurology book. Okay. Um, goes like I think it's great. A uh, couple of the guys I know have done that neurology diplomate, you know, through the Carrick Institute, which, good grief, like that's another <laughs> level of smarts that, yeah, not all that. But I think, I you know, when you talk about trying to piece things together, I think that functional neurology side is truly fascinating. I'm really intrigued with functional medicine too. It's just not a skill set of mine. But I know like Brett's instituted it where he's at. Um, so I think if you're trying to think about like a holistic approach to dealing with patients and sometimes what we're dealing with physically isn't always solved through rehab and manual therapy and physical medicine stuff, there might be some neurology and some stuff going on hormonally uh, that might be a little bit out of, I mean, right now for me, I don't get, but I'm, I'm super intrigued by it. Um, but those would kind of be, those are my current books. I'm always going to those. Yeah. Okay. That one sounds interesting. Yeah. What's something that uh, you do to make the complicated simple? Whether that is uh, in practice and in, in training in uh, programming or what have you. Um, I don't know who said it, but I always liked it. But it's, uh, you know, the, the basics have, have stood the test of time for a reason. And I don't know why they're called the basics, right? You know, like, like, in strength, <laughs> Never like thought of strength that. training, like, you know, there, there's, you know, there, there's that big, like, sports-specific training push, right? But yeah. nothing's more sports-specific training than sport practice, right? Right. Yeah. Like, okay. okay, like, if you have a 100-meter sprinter, their competitive event is the 100-meter sprint. And in order of specificity of training – Everything basically you tiered it out. Block starts, acceleration work, top end speed work. Weight room stuff becomes pretty general to them. Weight room stuff becomes pretty general to most athletes, unless you're a power lifter, crossfitter, uh, competitive weightlifter, right? So weight weight training, you know, for an athlete for the most part is about movement patterns. And developing some systematic stuff there from body control, strength, power, and so on that you hope expresses itself in sport practice and competition, right? So stuff like lunges, squats, deadlifts, presses, pulls, and so on all have relevance. You know, like you don't – I think because everybody's competing for marketability and exposure, it's like, well, how can we make this thing seem more complicated than the next, right? right? When you think about some athletes that came well before our years, and like amazing athletes, like Bo Jackson's one of my favorite athletes of all time, you know? And uh, I don't think Bo was doing most of what's going on nowadays, right? No, probably not. Right? No. You know, like, I, I you ever see the th 30 for 30 on him that ESPN did? I think. Um, you know, one of the things he was revered for in baseball was his arm strength, you know, and he used to just go in the woods and chuck like apples or stuff like that or stones, I think. And that's how he got better. Right. You know, Vladimir Guerrero, who was one of the best hitters in his time in the major leagues, he grew up, I think it was Puerto Rico, but he would play a game with a broomstick and a bottle cap. Wow. He would throw bottle caps and he had to hit the bottle cap. So to him, a baseball looks like a balloon. No kidding. Right. Right. I mean, it, there's different stories like that. You know, like we don't have to overly calm. You can stick to, I think free play is amazing and is underutilized. I think creativity and just creating that sense of exploration in training is a lost thing, you know, um, I think it's just been dominated by we got to work harder, we got to work more intense, we got to go, 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 and we're going to sweat, and we're going to you're going to work until you sweat plasma and you're puking in that bucket over there, <laughs> right? Like it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I think it's just 
something just going back to the basics, knowing that they've stood the test of time. Um, and even in, even with rehab and treating patients, you know, it's, I think it's the same thing. I mean, we're always learning and you're fine tuning. Um, but I, I just like, don't lose faith in what it is that we've done for so long, you know, because a competitor down the street is all of a sudden they got this latest gizmo or that, you know, or they're doing this now. It's like, it may draw people away from you, but I think they're, you know, they're going to be drawn away for the wrong reasons. And the people that are going to stick with you, you know, you've had since day one and they've bought into what you do and they know it works for them. Yeah. Cool. What uh, three take home tips do you have? Three take home tips. Um, well, I guess one would be what I said earlier, you know, like changing function is a daily task. You know, so if you're actually truly committed to it, it's like it's like sport practice. If you want to get better, you know, you can hear all the stories about go out and practice. And Brett said it, you know, practice with intent. You know, you got to have your mindset into what you're doing. Um, but it's it's got to be a daily thing, and you got to you got to accept that for what it is. And you know, don't pout and complain when if you're not doing what you're doing to get better. You know, sometimes that's that's a tough one for some people, but it's, Hey, are you doing your part type thing? Um, the other one would be, um, it's not easy. You know, like what we do isn't easy. And then what we're asking a lot of times for people to do isn't easy, you know, so it's not necessarily for everyone. Um, you know, it's like you get caught up in the quick and the, you want that, uh, simple solution. And a lot of times it doesn't exist. You know, they want the miracle, um, but it's not, it's not easy. It's a, it's a grind and you gotta, you gotta work for it. You know, if you want, yeah, it's like a lot of times, um, I used this analogy one time with a patient and I used to draw a lot when I was young, a lot. Like I just love the sketch. And so sometimes at school, different art projects, or even I did some community things, like I'd submit something and my my parents would hear stuff like, oh, your son's a good artist. Like, we all like to draw. Like, they have a natural talent. And I always wondered after years, like, how much of that was truly natural talent or was just I was willing to spend more time at it than most. Like, if I was studying something and drawing, like, the time that I would spend just to get a line right or get the shading right, you know, that sort of thing. You know, like if I was willing to do that and they weren't, that's not much natural talent. I never saw it as natural talent. I just saw it as I'm willing to sit here until it looks the way I want it to look. Sure. Um, so I guess uh, it's that would be it. And then the other one is I think you just got to have fun. Do You know, like when it comes to exercise, like a lot of people, I think they, they get drawn to what they connect with. Right. I mean, we joke, Kyle, like I'll never be an endurance guy. <laughs> still, I, still don't think so. No. <laughs> I mean, I'll I'll run sprints all day. Yeah. You know, you know, I'll, I'll do I'll do fifteen hundred meters worth of tempos and sprints. But ask me to run a fifteen hundred meter you know race, I'll roll my eyes and walk away. Like no <laughs> way, like, it's not happening. But you know, there's a lot out there, and besides our competitive athletes and people that are really pushing for something, I think people are ultimately going to. I think be drawn to what interests them and what keeps them driven. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, what we do isn't necessarily for everybody. Um, but um, I, I think if we can provide them that environment where they're enjoying it, um, they're seeing the progress that they're hoping to see um, and they're achieving those type of goals, then that'll just kind of feed its itself um but not everybody comes to us you know wants to be a competitive power lifter and they don't have to be or they don't have to be an athlete and if they just look to lose weight and we can try to make things interesting for them in the process um where it doesn't get stale and boring and redundant um then that 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 goes a long way too you know it, yeah yeah gotta enjoy it yeah <clears throat> God, yeah, God, God, enjoy. They're just, they're not going to do it. You know, they're not going to get me to walk on a treadmill. I'll go, I'll go hike. You know, I like that. I like being outside. Right. But 
if we're trying, that's where you want sustainability. Yep. You, know, you want to provide people with, with sustainable actions and that's huge in nutrition and it's huge in fitness and, and, and wellness. So it's like, if I told someone, no, I want you to walk on a treadmill and this is how you're going to lose your 20 minutes of, you're, you're going to lose your 20 pounds of fat by doing a half hour of fasted cardio in the morning. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. But if I tell them like, Hey, you know, this is how we can structure your eating, make it more flexible. You know, they're not so locked into a certain way of eating or they have to do fasted cardio and there's some wiggle room there and it's, you know, you keep them in a calorie deficit, but Hey, get out and walk, walk your dog, walk your children, you know, this, like, then I think they're more inclined to make that a sustainable action because you're looking for a lifestyle change. For sure. You know, like somebody might do fasted cardio for two weeks and are they going to give up? Maybe. But what happens after that? You know, so I think it's just you're trying to look for things to help make people sustainable too. Yep. That they can implement. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Well, um, I know we're at uh, time for your, your patient to get your care here. So yeah, man. anything before we go or uh, where can people find you? Um, so, yeah, we are on the worldwide internet, GallagherPerformance.com. I uh, have YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, you know, try to post some content there. Um, uh, but that's pretty much where we can find it. You know, I appreciate the time with you guys. I'll be plugging you whenever this thing's ready to go, you know, because uh, I'm really impressed with your work, Joel. You know, obviously you undertake this big time. So this is a heck of a task and it's, you guys are doing an awesome job and Kyle. Yeah. Kyle, as always, you and Eric are killing it. So always fun to follow you. Like you said, you gotta have fun doing it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, thank you guys. I mean, this has been, uh, it's been fun and I hope it's good for your, your listeners and good for you guys getting your exposure and growing your brand. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, Thank for you for your time. time. Yeah, it was great. Yep. Talk soon. All right. Talk soon, boys. All right. Take care. All right. Thank you for checking out this episode of Clinically Pressed. Go to clinicallypressed.com for full show notes and links to everything that was covered in this episode. While you're there, you have access to all of our episodes, insights, and shorts. You can find Clinically Pressed on YouTube and any podcast outlet. If you could give us a rating, thumbs up, or review on how we are doing, we would greatly appreciate it. To get more free content delivered to your inbox, sign up for the Total Athletic Therapy Newsletter. You'll get direct links to all new clinically pressed episodes, reviews on some of the latest research in health and performance, and links to related podcasts and other items meant to help you make the complicated simple and optimize performance. Thank you for listening and see you next episode.